The next talk is a massively multilingual sentence embeddings uh, for their short cross-lingual transfer and beyond, uh, which is presented by Michael. No, actually, it's yeah. me. <laughs> I, I'm Holger Schwenk, the second author. Oh, author. sorry. <laughs> so, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot for staying until the last talk of today. So, this is actually a little bit different talk. It's uh, not directly on. It's semantics in a different way. And actually, it's a tackle paper, so it, uh, the research was done uh, a little bit a couple of months ago. So what we're interested in is our multilingual models. So right now in the world, we have more than 7,000 languages. Uh, and actually, almost 40% of them are considered endangered, which means that less than 1,000 people speak it. And if you look, uh, only 23 languages account for half of the population. This actually means that most of the languages of the world are not considered at all in NLP. Roughly right now, we have machine translation for about 100 languages, obviously only the most important ones. And if you look ahead, uh, different applications and machine translation, the most of NLP is very English-centric. So any other NLP talk is mostly English until a couple of months ago, now things are changing. And so what is often done, said if you want to handle, I don't know, dialogue system or some sentence classification in a different language, you translate it into English, you handle the task in English, and then maybe translate back. So we propose a different approach, is we try to have a multilingual sentence representation. So what's the idea? Just have an embedding of the whole sentence, not averaging uh, word vectors or something like this, which does not depend on the language. This means if you have two sentences which are mutual translation, you calcul calculate the embedding that's are very close in this embedding space. So if you have this representation, what we could do for it, first of all, we could what we call zero short transfer. So you have one application, you train it on English, and then without any fine tuning or modification or adaptation, you apply it to all the languages adapted, uh, um, covered by your model. And also, if you train a model to, bene uh, to handle many languages, you have some benefits between the languages because they're not all so different. And actually, what are you learning then? If you have a representation which does not depend on the language, so what is common at the end, it's the meaning. So you get a highly semantic representation without the need to specify during training what is semantics. Because we want to have semantics since 20 or 30 years, and people even can't agree how to semantically label data, so how you can train it. And here actually you get a really semantic representation without the need to, to label it. So that's what we get at the end, that sentences with a similar meaning are closed in this embedding space. So it can be in the same language, English or whatever you want, or in a different language. So what is this good for? So actually many applications for these semantic representations. So first of all, the CO short transfer, you train it on usually English and transfer different language. And then we can use it to something very different, in particular to find parallel sentences out in the web. So because if you have two sentences, and you can calculate the distance measure in this embedding space, actually this measure is a very good indicator if they're mutual translations or not. More or less, you just need to threshold it. Then we can do large-scale similarity research, basically take billions of sentences, calculate the embeddings, and then if you're fast, search engine in the embedding space, you can find similar sentence. And that's pretty powerful, actually, because you can use it for paraphrasing by search. So you're not constructing some arbitrary sentences by language models, but you really use real sentences which are similar to the input sentence. And it's quite surprising, but you can find out there in the web. Or you could use the same approach to do data augmentation. You have some training corpus, and then you for search for similar sentence and just keep the label, for instance. So obviously, I have only 15 minutes, so I can do everything. So I will focus a little bit on my Pytex mining. So how we train this uh, multilingual sentence embedding? Actually, it's a pretty easy architecture. The so main idea is you have a sequence-to-sequence -sequence approach, like multilingual neural machine translation, but with a big difference, because we want to have a sentence embedding, so we don't have attention mechanism. But instead, we're doing some max pooling over the encoder layers, and this is then the input to the decoder. And you can see it at the end, something like a constant attention, because this sentence vector, we put it at each, at each time step of the decoder. Instead of doing attention and deciding where to look at in the input, it gets always a full sentence. 
And surprisingly, if you just take a multilingual MT system which translates from many languages into English, you already get a shared sentence representation. Because for the decoder, it would be very complicated. Uh, each sentence corresponds to a point in the space. So for the decoder, it would be very complicated to do the embedded French sentence there and then a Spanish sentence somewhere else and always create the same English sentence. So it gives you already a, a shared representation. And it's surprising that you don't need, for instance, a ranking loss between the representations of the different languages or maybe GAN that tries to predict the language you want to fool it. You don't need it. It's really a nice and simple approach. The only drawback, if you do it like this, you don't have English at the input, which may be the most important language. Because if you put English in the input, you have an out encoder, and we tried it with noise or something like this, it doesn't work really well. So just to, to handle the English, we introduced a second output language, in our case it was Spanish, and we trained the system, in this case, for many different input languages, and also Spanish to output. I should emphasize that you don't need all the languages aligned with English and Spanish. Because once you have a couple of languages, uh, it's, it's, the encoder is already pretty well conditioned, and you can add, for instance, I don't know, Indi to, to English or Tagalog to English, only aligned with English. You don't need to align with Spanish. Right now, there's a big tendency to have uh, self-supervised systems, and we, it's supervised, we need parallel, parallel data. But actually, this is parallel data that is really easy to find. You just need public data like uh, you can find and open subtitles and stuff like this. And even we don't use all of it. OK, we, we did this. And actually, we tried to scale up to many languages. And at the end, we have 93 languages. And the list is here. So you may be, many people know 10 or 20 languages. And there's a couple of languages we maybe have even never heard about it. So for Asian people, I guess they may not, don't know what is Basque. And for European people, they don't know Telugu or Tagalog, which is just around the corner. So we have all these languages. What's actually quite surprising, if you know the languages, you have many different scripts. And we have one encoder, which is simple bile STM, which handles all these 21, 22 different scripts. I see on the screen the scripts, and if you look, they're very, very different. And actually, the encoder, when you train it, we use a short BP vocabulary for all these scripts, which is really not too big, with 50K. So he's forced to share, um, let's say, byte tokens or character tokens among the languages. And we have a different study with a very, really nice overlap. And this actually means that we can do uh, code switching. So we tried. If you put a sentence which contains some English, some, Spanish, some, some Chinese, he can handle it. He even doesn't know for each word or each token which language is in. So it's totally language agnostic. OK, let's use this approach. Uh, so I mentioned already then we have these CO short transfer and many NLP tasks like classification, NLI, your question answering. Then these by text mining, so try to find Paul sentence on the internet. So based on the knowledge that the sentence similarity is proportional to the distance in the joint space, we just need to calculate distances or the similarity search and so on. And I want to emphasize for all these applications, we use one sentence embedding. It's also actually called a tool, but it's laser, which is free available. I spoke about this at the end. We don't need any fine tuning. So this semantic representation is surprisingly good for many different tasks. Obviously, right now, fine tuning is very hot. But sometimes it's a little bit annoying. Or actually, the, the tool is out there, and there are more than 2,000 users. Sometimes people that don't want to fine tune because you need data, you need to collect data. And there are also a lot of users in industry that just want to be good, have, have a good sentence representation without bothering how to fine tune it to a task. Just give me some examples for NLI tasks. So, it's a corpus called XNLI, which uh, generalizes NLI to 14 different languages. This means for, input, for two sentences, you have to decide are they are related, neutral, or opposite. And we use this, we use the, the, the laser embeddings, train the classifier in English only, and then can transfer it to many different languages without using any resource in that language. And actually, what's nice, since these rep representations are totally language agnostic, they're not aligned with English. Everything is aligned into one joint space. So we can do any combination. And here are some examples. But basically, you have a Bulg Bulgarian sentence and a Hindi sentence, and the system has to decide are they related or not. Or whatever, I, I know, Arabic and Swahili, and Thai and Spanish. It's not always the same language or with English. It can do anything. 
The second application is Bitex mining, and this is working really well. So the idea is pretty simple. You have two monolingual corpora with a lot of sentences, billions of sentences, and just calculate all the distances. So Bitex mining is actually a pretty old research with many handcrafted things and tons of features to decide are the sentences are parallel or not. You just calculate the distance. So you can improve this a little bit instead of using just a cosine distance with a threshold. We use a margin criterion, but I don't need to go into equations right now. And actually, this works surprisingly well. We introduced this uh, about a year ago already now, the first paper, and until today, to the best of my knowledge, it's still state-of-the-art. So there's an, um, an evaluation called BAC, where basically we have a corpus, and we know which are the alignments hidden in a bigger corpus, you have gold references, and you calculate the F1 score. And if you look at these numbers, uh, we outperform the, the previous state of the art by quite a large margin. And this for all the languages. So here is German, French, Russian, and Chinese. And it's also nice to see that the performance is pretty stable across all these languages. It's not that Chinese works much worse than the other ones. It's pretty stable. And also what's interesting, so we had different approaches with the first system only trained for these languages, these four languages of the evaluation. And the new system trained on 93 languages. You could say, well, maybe it gets to be confused with all these languages and all these scripts that you have to encode, which are not needed for this task, but actually it's working better. Because if you want to do German English, and we also have uh, Danish English and Norwegian English, which are language of the same family, you have a benefit of the different languages. And you can even push this idea farer. We trained a different system on European languages, so the European Commission, and this goes basically onto the Russian border. So we have a couple of Slavic languages, but not any single Russian word. And then we tried to mine parallel data, English and Russian. And it works. So we get an F1 score of 62. It's not as good as the other one, but it does work. Also, we have never seen any Russian word. Obviously, for Russian, we have resources. We don't need it. It's just a proof of concept, because this idea is very interesting if, on, if you want to handle these low-resource languages. Even in Europe, you have a, a lot of little bit local languages like Galician, which are variants of, a, of French or, or Spanish, and we can handle this without even having any specific data for those. Same holds, for instance, for Nepali, which is very close to Hindi. On one hand, you can mine for parallel data, but you can also filter existing data. Let's say somebody gives you a copy and says, this is parallel, these are mutual translations but you have some doubts, you can use this approach to calculate the distance measure and then decide I keep or I don't keep. And we did this. There was a relation this summer for low-resource language, in particular Nepali and Tinala. And so we trained the system on this, and actually it performed very well. So the goal was to, to take a big corpus and to filter out only the best sentences. And without going too much into details, actually we are able to, to outperform all the other participants in the relation by 20%, 25% relative. Okay, I think we're pretty close to the end. So all this uh, tool is, is freely available. It's called Laser. So if you go on the internet and type Laser and GitHub, you will find it easily. So it's pretty well established now in the community, in academia, and I um, have feedback of a lot of in industry users. So it's one model for all the applications that I mentioned. So you no need to, to fine-tune and to play around and hack something. And not right now, we have 93 languages supported, and actually it can generalize to a couple of variants better. So it's totally language agnostic, so you don't need to tell the language its, its input, and if you get it wrong, it's actually not so bad. Um, right now, a lot of people speak about these huge transformers. They're very efficient, but actually if you want to do mining at a large scale, you need also some speed. And the advantage of this toolkit is pretty fast. You can embed, calculate sentence embeddings about 2,000 sentences per second on a GPU. So it's, as far as I know, it's currently the state of the art for Bitex filtering and mining, and a couple of many people use it. But it can be also used for, for sentence classification. But, well, NLP, as you know, moves very fast. So models on BERT, they're better on the English side, even if they don't transfer so well, but because they're much better on English, so finally they're a little bit better. Just give me a mention a different work which is related to this. So this bytext mining, there was this task on, on bug, and actually then we decided, well, it works so well, let's try it somewhere else. And we took Wikipedia, which exists in many, many languages, 
and we systematically try to extract parallel data for all language pairs. So at the end, we cover 85 languages. We not only have parallel data English to, to Hindi or something like that, but all the pairs. So we have Hindi with Swedish or Russian with Arabic, all the pairs. So you can see it a little bit here on, on the right that actually the matrix, oh, shown, which shows you all the possible combinations. At the end, we have more than 100 million parallel data in 1,600 different language pairs. So there's a, there's a paper if you have to look at it. And actually, this data is freely available because it's Wikipedia, so we can distribute it and can download. And it was actually already used by people and they saw some interesting gains. Okay, so I think it's over. I will skip this one. Thank you very much for your attention in many languages. Okay. So, um, thanks for your interesting talk right here. Uh, where are you? <laughs> okay. Um, I was wondering in uh, like a encoder decoder model such as transformer, um, the uh, system really only cares about the target language. So w the results that you show about uh, like four different languages having comparable like scores in the 90s mm -hmm. or whatever, yeah, um, they all have target languages as English. Uh, so I don't know to what extent your conclusion no, no. could be valid in. So when we train, we need an alignment either with English and Spanish. And actually, I should have told you, once the system is trained, basically, I throw away the decoder. We don't need it anymore. We only use the encoder to embed any sentence in this joint representation. Okay, so you didn't do okay. So we don't care about the decoder anymore. At the end, it's an empty system, but I never calculate blue scores. That's the goal. Okay, and the second question is, I don't know to what extent or how cleanly parallel the, um, the data you release is? Have you done quality control on that? Yes, we, we did. So well, obviously for English and French and stuff like this, there's a baselines, but uh, many other language pairs like Korean to Indonesian, nobody did it. But there's a corpus called the TED corpus, which has a test set of uh, 45 different languages. And actually we run NMT on all language pairs. And for many, we have decent results if 20 or 30 plus score, but there are no baselines. Obviously, for some of them, like if you align uh, Tagalog with uh, Sinali, with the language in Africa, the bytecks are extremely limited. It's 30 or 40k, at least it would give you a test that then the plus scores are low. But there's no free lunch. But you need at least 100,000 sentences. So we provide some indication how good are the, the bytecks. Hi, uh, thank you for this great work. Uh, so I have a question. I'm wondering if you have already tried um, re uh, replacing the BIOS TM uh, with self-attention for the encoder? So uh, the architecture that is on the screen, it's, it's generic. There are no assumption what type of encoder you use. You just need a fixed size representation. And we could use a transformer, obviously. So that's on the, the to-do list. We haven't tried it right now. But like I mentioned before, uh, it's actually nice that the system is running fast. Because if you do this by text mining for the whole Wikipedia, you have to calculate a lot of embeddings. And if you have this gigantic uh, transformer and maybe have a minor gain, you, you're hesitating. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for your talk. I have a question about your model. You, you train your model with the bytex, right? Mm -hmm. And have you ever tested your model on zero-shot machine translation? Uh, yeah. So you, we, to amuse ourselves, some, some, somehow we calculate blur scores, but it's, it, actually if you go back to the beginning of uh, neural machine translation, it's, it's an architecture like this. It works pretty well, but since we have... Um, a fixed size sentence representation, little hope that it will work for really long sentences. Okay. Okay. Because then that was the idea of attention, because if you have a sentence that's too long, you, you're losing a little bit of thing. But the goal is really not to do empty. You just use empty to get as a byproduct this highly semantic or multilingual representation. Okay. Thank you. I guess we are running out of time. Uh, let's thank Holger uh, uh, again. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming and enjoy the social events in Disneyland. <laughs>